Welcome back to the Fullerton College Pre-Press class, Combined Print 7577 Lecture. This is Professor Ben Kewitt, and we're going to finish out PIA Pre-Press Trainees Manual Section 1.3 Digital File Basics, where we give you a brief introduction to the different types of files stored on your computer that are necessary for pre-press. A lot of this is probably rather review-y for many of you who've been using computers for years, but it's still worth looking at it. In fact, it's probably more worth your time to look at the older stuff rather than the newer stuff. Uh, hopefully the semi-related video that I put up in the class here helps you understand that a little bit, or at least gave you a good chuckle and some fun memories. Anyways, applications and utilities. Let's do this one. Uh, you need software for your computer to do anything. The hardware is all the physical components, the wires, the transistors, the semiconductors. Oh, sorry, I slipped into my engineer voice. Uh, but all those parts of your computer that make it work but they need something to do. They need software. Otherwise, it's like a person with no personality and they're like brain dead. Their body's working, but it's not doing anything. They don't, they're not able to be themselves. You need the software part to make the computer do anything. And the software does things. Uh, we definitely use applications to create documents. We know it as a create, Adobe Creative Cloud. Although, um, as a t-shirt I recently saw kindly reminds me, there is no such thing as the cloud there's only somebody else's computer. Keep that in mind when you think about this magical cloud. It just means someone else's computer is storing your info. But anyways, so software does those things. There's also utilities which don't create documents and don't run things like games. Utilities are in the background software that manages your fonts and manages your color settings and keeps your hard drive working. They're functional, they're important. They're not the fun parts. Uh, Back to the person analogy, these are like not, these are the parts of your brain that are not exactly your personality or your likes, or your interests, or your abilities. This is the brainstem stuff that keeps you breathing. And to a slightly greater degree, sometimes it's your memory that helps you remember all those things you've learned. But it's not necessarily the part that's the fun part that does things. But it needs to be there. I'm talking too long about that. Font files, let's get to the stuff that I find interesting. Fonts, typefaces, this stuff is great. This is actually, uh, what my dad used to do for Xerox when I was a little boy and slightly before I was born, he helped create digital fonts as a thing. And he worked on type one files when they were first developing them for digital printing in the Xerox, the Southern California part of, of Xerox at least, not up in Park, although he visited there once or twice. Uh, digitizing fonts that existed in the real world as lead or uh, teletype, uh, you know, uh, photographic film types that you could use for the late 70s and early 80s type offset uh, plate making. And he worked on creating them in ways that a computer could use them and store them on a printer as postscript. Blah, 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 blah. Type one, true type, and open type, the three types of fonts you see out there. And your type one font is why I gave you the ROUS video from Princess Bride at the beginning of this, because you're pretty sure they don't exist. Type one fonts, oh, those went extinct years ago. ROUS is, I don't think they really exist. And then one jumps out of the jungle behind you. Sorry, swamp. I didn't mean to offend any diehard fans. I am one, I swear. They jump out and they grab you and they start attacking you and you didn't realize what's, what's hit you. And a type one font does still exist. Type one fonts involve some clever computer workarounds for early computing. Uh, remember that computers were not always as good as they are now. And even now, your computer may not be as good as you think it is, he says, with tears welling in the backs of his eyes because he really wants to play some AAA game titles and he can't, womp womp. So type one, to get around the problem the computers didn't have the processing power to actually show you vector information on your screen live, they had two fonts in one. Inside a type one font, there is the font that you see on your computer screen, which was a pixel-based preview of the font, and the pixels were large. This is early computers, so you couldn't really see them the same way you see them now. But there's also a perfect vector version that would come out when you actually printed that would come out the right way. So if you knew your typefaces and you knew your fonts, you would be able to compose beautiful things, but it wasn't quite WYSIWYG. It was close, but it wasn't all the way there. Also type one fonts were platform specific. And this is where it could be a problem for you today. Um, actually it could be more than one problem for you today as um, both Windows and Mac are no longer compatible with their older versions of their own files. If you bring out some applications and some files from Mac 9, uh, OS 9 or earlier, you cannot run them without emulation on your OS 10 and above Mac computers. I know that some of the early Windows files and DOS files also are not openable on modern Windows computers. So it could be a problem of compatibility. I'm not saying it will be, but there could be a problem with these. 
They're platform specific and they're also era specific. So you got two levels of a problem there. Also, they're limited to 256 glyphs. 256 is an oddly specific number, isn't it guys? Isn't it? Nudge, nudge, nudge. I think we know what that means. I think we means that, that the font's character set is given to one byte of memory. Wouldn't you say? I would say so. Or at least the directory that calls them up is. True type is the more recent stuff. True type was, uh, is available on both systems. Uh, this is one of those things when the world started to come together right now. And Mac and Windows started to reach their hands across the world and <laughs> across the street in San Jose, really, and grab each other by the hands and say, it's fine, let's be friends now. And true type lets you take the same font to either system and it works just fine. It's only one file. That one file means that you have only the vector information. Because at this point, by the time true type existed, computers were capable of showing you vector type on your screen as you typed it. Because they finally had enough processing power that giving some of that power over to showing you what it was doing was worth the expenditure of that power. Before that, it was not. It would actually severely cripple the, uh, or compromise, perhaps cripple your system, trying to show you, the user, uh, the lofty thoughts of your computer down in the mortal realms. But uh, nowadays, with the uh, processing power and the abilities we have on our computers, it doesn't matter. It'll show it to you live. So literally what you are seeing on your screen is the same information that's being sent to the printer, not a preview thereof. But in both cases, type one and true type, Palatino is still a beautiful typeface, especially the italic. Mwah, it's one of my favorite italics. The low ASCII uh, characters, the 128 common ones, are common. You know, numbers, letters A through Z, or Z if you're anywhere but here in the US. Uh, some of the basic, sometimes uh, non-English characters, although not all of them. All the numbers, and then the basic punctuations, the ones that you get by holding shift once and typing a number or something. Those are all the same on Windows and Mac. But when you start to get to weird characters, and I'm sorry to say weird, I'm, I'm not trying to be the white colonial guy here. Um, I'm a native English speaker, so from my experience, things like enyes and any sort of letter with a stress over it to be in Spanish, French, Italian. Heck, Vietnamese uses French character set because uh, of, well, man, depressing white colonial reasons. But uh, Vietnamese is often written in Roman letters using the French character set, like the C's with the squigglies. I don't have a name for it. But anyways, those types of characters are different on Windows and Mac. For instance, because I know how also umlauts and things from the Scandinavian and Germanic languages, uh, those, those uh, Northern European languages also use special characters like the O with a cross through it and the U with the dots on top, umlauts, um, which are fun, uh, actually. And uh, umlauts are cool. That's how you get words like Uber and stuff. Uh, anyways, if you want to type an enye, for those who don't type Spanish regularly or at all, an enye is a letter N with a squiggly, the tilde on top. On a Macintosh, you hold down the option key and you type the tilde key, and then you type the N and it puts the N underneath and it makes an enye. If you want to do the same thing on Windows, it's something like alt control U1783. It's like a, you have to do this whole alternate code thing to type it in, and it's really awkward. So uh, just because they have different directories and how the system thinks about it, because Mac sees option, option, uh, we'll, we'll go umlauts, for example, option U is umlauts for a Mac, but Windows sees alt U, one, seven, eight, five, five, five. You know, they're different letters. Even though they look the same to you, the human, the computers know them as different characters and they don't translate. So type one. Um, so the screen font is the out. One, I hit the wrong button, guys. I am so sorry. Let's fix this. True type, it uses the same thing. Also, ligatures and fractions. Ligatures are when you have two letters that are going to touch each other, so it just connects them. Like think of a lowercase f and a lowercase l. So you're going to write the word fluoride out, and you're not worried about the purity of your essence. Fluoride, the communist plot to taint our bodily fluids. Uh, anyways, f l, lowercase f, lowercase l. The, the L and the F, the ascenders of both of those would kind of awkwardly sort of touch. So a ligature is making it so they do touch and they become a single letter. Let me show you what I mean. This is also one of those hopefully mind-blowing, or maybe not, you guys, some of you guys are pretty classy and already know a lot of stuff about typography, but one of those mind-blowing moments, one of those party tricks you can pull out when you try to impress your friends at parties, you know, when parties happen again someday. 
is did you know that even in the English alphabet, there are more than 26 letters? <gasps> Gasp. Yes, you can win that bet with people because there are combination letters of two letters stuck together. Let me show you. On the left, I've made it so the F and the L. Oh, you know what? Hold on a second. Oops. Your teacher is not infallible. Here we are in InDesign, much better. So we have the two sets of FL on the left and on the right. On the left, you can see that the letters are F and L. L kind of looks like a one in this typeface. On the right, let me undo that. You can see that the L and the F at the top of the ascenders touch much more elegantly. On the left, it's awkward and there's a little notch out of there and it's not quite all connected in all the right way. The one on the right, they're put together into one thing. Sometimes lowercase t's, let's try ft. Oh, look at that. Did you see that uh, for like a word like oft or wait, hold on. I'm supposed to be nautical. Aft, like the back end of a ship. F and T, you'll notice that the cross beam connects. Let's do another one. The lowercase f has a lot of great ones. F, I, like finance. Oh my gosh, look at that. They're connected. There's no awkward I underneath. Let's see if I can fix this. Let me screw this up for us. If I change the F over, now it looks like a person bending over to read a plaque. Can you see that? You can't unsee it once you've seen it. He's standing up, he's bending over a guardrail, which is waist high, and he's reading a plaque. And there's his head, which is the I dot. So if we go over here and we uh, make that an F, whoa. But anyways, if you type FI, those letters next to each other, you get like this. So a lot of things will automatically do that for you in InDesign. One of the many things that it gives you that stuff like <coughs> Word <coughs> doesn't really give you. So I like this sort of thing. It's much more elegant. There's no reason to have that awkward dot of the I and the bent overhead of the F all trying to compete for the same physical space. And that's a ligature. So those sorts of things also have some trouble with their, let me switch back over here, with true type sometimes. So if it's, if it's cross platform, if you type that on a Windows computer and you pass it over, it can have issues. Although with some things like InDesign and uh, other high-end graphics and uh, layout softwares, sometimes they will have their own coding to make sure this is not a problem. But just know that could be an issue swapping from one system to another. Open type is even better and it has more memory applied to it. It's just like true type, except that it has 65,000 glyphs. I'm being quiet for a second for your shock response. Everyone's amazed, right? Good, moving on. 65,000, that just means they gave it a lot more memory and it's uh, actually rounded. 65,000 is not a base two number. It's, uh, it's rounded a little bit from the actual number. Anyways, so on a printout sheet, assuming they all function on your machine, if you're creating a document, you can use true type, open type, and type one, and they should all be the same. Assuming they're all the same manufacturer, they're all the correct version of a font, because there's other problems with having the wrong version of Times New Roman, which we'll talk about another time. Uh, if there's one font that scares me, it's Times. Just because there are so many versions out there, you don't know if your version's the same version that someone else is using, and the computers just kind of assume it's the same, but they're not. But let's say you're all using Garamond, or something classy like that. So if you're using Garamond, and I'm using Garamond, and yours is a type one, and mine is an open type, and someone else is using a type one, it'll all look the same when you print it. They're all perfectly good, perfectly usable, no problems, so long as the type one functions on your system, it's just as good. It may look a little weirder on your monitor, because that's what they're functioning to do. Document files. Let's take a look at these. I may have to come back for a third video. This has been one of the longest weeks of videos. So let's stop here for now uh, with the end of the font talk because I'm already at 14 minutes and I need to go a little bit more into the next one. See you in the next video.